This video is sponsored by Skillshare. I have a whole bunch of different things I wanna get good at. I wanna play the guitar better. I wanna edit my videos better. I wanna become a better rock climber. And of course, I wanna stop getting crushed in Fortnite so much. Damn it, new master. But like you, I only have so much time during the day to practice. And I've noticed that when I sit down to practice, sometimes I'll make great strides, but other times I feel like I make no progress at all. What causes this discrepancy? Well, as it turns out, improvement isn't only determined by how many hours you practice, but by the quality of your practice as well. Amongst athletes, artists, gamers, and practitioners of every other discipline, the people at the top of their game are almost always the ones who understand the skill of deliberate practice. Like active learning, self-discipline, and even empathy, deliberate practice is really a meta skill, a higher order skill that can be applied across nearly everything you do. So. What's the first step to practicing more deliberately? Intent is I think the biggest thing. I mean, you asked the question of like what separates a, a practice session from just kind of like playing. And I think the answer is intent. Like mm -hmm. you, you, you really want to say, um, you know, I would like to leave with something that I didn't have before I sat down. That's my friend Charles Cornell, who, as you can tell, is a pretty phenomenal jazz piano player. In 2019, his online following exploded after he started posting these piano memes. You might have even seen this one. And through years spent in a music conservatory, as well as in countless hours of intense practice alone, Charles has learned that the best practice sessions are the ones that start out with a goal in mind. Where you're going to pick up a lot of ground and make a lot of headway is when you define what you are going to do in the practice room. Right. What can happen a lot is that you go into the practice room and you wind up just playing things that you already know because it's pleasing to the ears. It's, it's something that we can do that we can enjoy. It, it's much harder to say, I'm going to do some of the things that I don't enjoy as much, but I know why I'm doing them. So that's really the first step to deliberate practice. Know what you wanna have accomplished at the end of the practice session. To give you just one example, right now I'm working on shooting a music video for a new song that I just released. And all the guitar parts in the song are improvised, but I need to know how to play them again for the video. So lately, all my practice sessions have had the explicit goal of learning and perfecting a segment of the song. But it's not enough to just have a goal. Like Charles said, you also need to be disciplined enough to do the things that are gonna get you to that goal. And to be honest, it's only the looming need to shoot this music video that has me sitting down slowly, painfully transcribing my own solo. And I know that's the kind of practice that I should be doing most of the time, but I still find myself doing exactly what Charles said, sitting down and just noodling, playing things that I already know. I find my biggest problem with learning songs that other people have written is it's so slow and I can play pretty well improv. So whenever I sit down with a guitar, within five minutes, I'm, I find myself just noodling around, improv -ing. A lot of people find themselves falling into this pattern with their own skills, doing the easy, natural things instead of the hard stuff they know they're supposed to be doing. And personally, I'll take all the help I can get in overcoming this discipline problem, whether we're talking about learning songs on the guitar or drilling build patterns in Fortnite instead of just lazily jumping into quick play every time. And one thing Charles told me that was really helpful is that because he's studied the fundamentals, that slow, painful process of learning a song is now almost effortless for him. So that goes into a whole other level too, which yeah. is which furthers the point of like pushing through the things that are maybe are not as, as fun mm -hmm. or that seem more difficult, right? Because what you said is like when you, when, I, when you learn a song that somebody else has written that's already decided, mm -hmm. it's so long. Well, my solution for you for that is, okay, well, you need to learn more music theory. Because right. if, you in, if you equip yourself with the knowledge of being able to hear something and understand exactly what's going on, now that process is not slow anymore. I can hear a song once and right. I'll understand like, oh, okay, I, I get how this is structured. And I could probably play along and within, our, you know, two or three times, I'll have it down. It's instant, just about. But the only reason it's instant is because I've equipped myself with that knowledge base that like, okay, I understand music theory and I understand, you know, how that's applied to something that sounds like this and I can recognize those sounds. 
So clearly learning these fundamentals, or maybe we should call them not so fundamentals, is a key component to deliberate practice. But how do you figure out what those fundamentals are for your particular skill? Well, one great method is to seek out structured educational materials. The author Josh Kaufman stresses this in his book, The First 20 Hours, his book on rapid skill development. In the book, he argues that to learn a skill quickly, you should first identify the sub-skills that matter most to you. For me, that might be music theory, like Charles said. And once you've picked out a few of those sub-skills, the next step in Kaufman's process is to go out and learn enough about each one to start practicing. And this is all great advice. Tutorials, courses, and coaches can all offer guidance and sequencing that can help you make sure you're working on all the right things. They can also help you avoid hitting dead ends or developing bad habits that you'll have to unlearn later. But there's another, perhaps even more important method that Charles mentioned. One of my, you know, my jazz teacher growing up would always say that she learned more from listening than she ever did from all of the hours of practicing, the, the number of gigs she played, like all of that combined, she learned more from listening. And if we think, if we think about language as a spoken word, it's like, well, how does a child learn a language? They listen, yeah. They just listen, they, mm -hmm. and over a long period of time, it takes years for a child to develop that ability to now start to repeat things that they're hearing, yeah. and even more years for them to be able to string together functional sentences and then even more years for them to be able to form that vocabulary and those phrases and sentences into their own genuine authentic ideas right. that they can then put out to the world and the world goes, I understand what you're saying, mm -hmm. right? That is a lifelong process. Let's call this idea observation as practice. We are natural observers. As Charles said, it's how we pick our native language as children. And when we apply critical observation to skill development, we learn our skills much faster. So if you're learning how to skate, watch great skaters. If you're trying to get better at a game, study great gameplay from that game. If you're an aspiring author, read other great authors. And if you wanna get better at editing videos, well, I follow some really talented video editors on Twitter and they are constantly watching movies and breaking down shots of movies. Like there's one guy, I forget his name, but he, he he's always posting these just galleries of shots from a scene in a movie to show like, here's the cohesion and the color grading, or here's, you know, look at the dynamics between the different shots and different cameras. And like what that tells me is he's not spending all of his time editing. He's spending a lot of his time watching other people's movies and observing that. So I do that a lot too with, with my editing. I'll, I'll watch movies more often now with a critical eye because I'm trying to see, okay, what are you doing? And why, and why are you looking at that? You're pulling things that you want to try. Mm -hmm. You're pulling bits and pieces of that. Maybe it's certain angles or a certain color grading approach that you specifically want to apply to your own work. Yeah. Because you want to be like, oh, I want to understand how to use this. Mm -hmm. That is listening to music. We hear things that strike a chord with us, literally, and, mm -hmm. and, and we go, I want to sound like that. I want to play that sound. Anywhere where you're attempting to kind of develop a higher proficiency with something, looking at the proficient examples mm -hmm. and saying, I want to try this part and I want to take that part. Like that is the best way that you can learn anything. In other words, observe, but also copy. Take what you see and try it out sometimes. The jazz legend Clark Terry had a system for learning improvisation that he called imitate, assimilate, innovate. At first, imitate what you see, transcribe, and then take what you learn from the people you look up to and innovate with what you've added to your repertoire. Going back to the editing example, I've watched Edgar Wright movies like Scott Pilgrim vs. The World, which is my favorite movie of all time, and tried to essentially imitate what I've seen in the movies, both to pay homage to my favorite director, but also to learn what he was doing, what he was thinking, what techniques he was employing. And here's one more beautiful thing about copying. You get a built-in, instant, and guaranteed feedback mechanism. And feedback is crucial for skill development. I do wanna take a second to give a quick shout out to my friend Matt Diavella, as the video that you're watching right now is an attempt for me to get a little bit better at blending interviews and narration, which is a style that Matt employs so well on his channel. Now, some skills come with it built in. Chess is a great example. You make a move, somebody makes a move against you, instant feedback. For other skills, you can always get a coach, but that costs money, or submit your work for critique. But of course, that requires a willing audience. And if you have neither, copying still gives you a way to get feedback. You can always compare to the original to see how you did. Now, naturally, some people are gonna have worries about copying. 
but it's important to recognize that there is a big difference between passing off somebody else's work as your own and copying their work as a form of practice. The latter isn't just okay, it's often crucial. In music specifically, we transcribe. Mm -hmm. So in jazz, when, when we talk about transcribing, we are literally going and listening to an improvised solo, and we are going to replicate that identically. I mean, there are still things that that are ingrained in my mind that I know that I transcribe. Like, like here's this is a, a little bit of a Barry Harris thing. Um, now, why do we do that? Am I gonna get on stage and play his solo? No, of course not. There are no, it's interesting, there are no jazz covers in the way that, take uh, John Coltrane's Giant Step solo. Nobody is out there performing John Coltrane's solo. If they yeah. did, they'd be laughed off stage, right? Why is that? And at the same time, why is it that every saxophone player ever can play that solo? Why do we do that? Well, what, the reason that I would transcribe Barry Harris like that is I want to know what are the devices that he used to create the sound that we heard. Because when I heard that sound, I went, I like that. I want to have that in my vocabulary. Right. What is it? But we're not going to go and simply perform the transcription. Yeah. That would be pointless because Barry Harris already said it. John Coltrane already said it. We don't need to say it again. Mm -hmm. We want to say our own things. But how can we speak in that language if we don't know what people have said? Right. So. When you sit down to practice, spend some time deeply observing the people who are at the level you want to get to, and also spend some time copying their work so you can learn the language that they're speaking in terms of your skill. If you can do that while also not ignoring the fundamentals and setting strong intentions when you practice, you'll find yourself making a lot more progress than you used to. So throughout this video, we've talked about several specific techniques that you can use to improve the quality of your practice time. But there's one final point to keep in mind. No matter the skill, building mastery, true mastery, takes a lot of time. It takes self-discipline. And above all, it takes strong, long-term practice habits. Fortunately, habits are one thing that I've learned a lot about through all my research and experimentation into productivity over the last few years. And if you'd like to improve your own practicing habits, then you might want to take my habit building class on Skillshare. This class will help you break down your goals into actionable daily habits that have obvious action items, and then stick to those by tailoring your environment and by building systems and tools that can help to bolster your self-discipline. And in addition to that, Charles actually just launched his own class called Intro to Improvisation. And if you're a musician, you'll definitely want to check it out. What would it be like to sit down at your instrument and be able to play anything you want? end of the class, you're even going to find a 57 minute bonus lesson where Charles teaches me some techniques that improve my own playing. Here's a trick. Ready? Can we do it in the next key? Instead of D, can we start on E? Another thing you're going to find on Skillshare is live sessions. In fact, just recently I did an exclusive Q&A session for my Skillshare students, which just went up as a live replay on my profile. So in addition to my classes, you're going to be able to watch that as well. Of course, you'll also find thousands of other classes on Skillshare from tons of talented teachers that can help you boost your skills in areas like video editing, photography, UI and UX design, music production, and tons more. It is a huge resource, and it's also a very affordable one, with your annual plan starting at less than 10 bucks a month. And you can even get a free trial if you're one of the first 1,000 people to sign up using the link in the description down below. So use that link, sign up, go take one of my classes, or go take Charles's class and start boosting your skills today. Thanks, as always, for watching this video. If you found this video helpful, definitely hit that like button to show the YouTube algorithm what's up and get subscribed right there if you haven't done so already so you don't miss out on future videos here on this channel. Also, if you want to learn a little bit more about Notion, I just launched a new channel all about Notion tutorials. At least for now, we might branch into other stuff in the future, but check it out right there. It's called Thomas Frank Explains. If you're looking for more videos from yours truly, that is where you're going to find them in addition to this channel right here. I'll have a couple other videos on screen so you can smash your nose onto your phone screen to watch those for uh, extra style points or just click on them like normal. And beyond that, go do whatever you want. Go uh, spend the rest of your life savings on a first edition holographic Charizard card on eBay, because as always, I'm not your dad. That was literally the worst thing I've ever played.